So well, uh, welcome everyone. So excited to have you with us today, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, my name is Chris Wren, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Bob Reason, who I'll let introduce himself. Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, lots of fun names that I recognize in the chat. So it's good to, good to uh, be here with everybody. My name is Bob Reason. I, am, uh, I go uh, use the, the pronouns he and him. Um, nice to be here. Excellent. As we're getting started, um, it has become a tradition uh, in the United States among student affairs folks in particular in higher ed that we acknowledge the lands and the peoples um, on which we sit and where we work and that we continue to benefit from. Um, I work at Michigan State University, which occupies the mm -hmm. ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ijab Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. Great. And I am coming to you from, from Iowa State University, which is located on the ancestral lands and territory of the Iowa Nation. Uh, the United States obtained this land from the Meskwaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842. And both Iowa State and Michigan State are what are called land-grant universities in the United States. And if you're interested in learning about the history of land seizures um, and the reallocation of that land to white settlers and for the purposes of higher education, um, you should visit landgrabu.org, which actually uh, links the actual tracts of land to the institutions that continue to benefit from those lands. It's a really kind of cool resource and I really encourage folks to engage with that material. So we want to talk to you a bit about sort of what we put in the book, kind of give you an overview. So you'll learn some things about students in the United, college students in the United States today. You'll also learn, well, we will periodically say, oh, and you can get more, for it. We're more in the book, but you will get some actual um, content and some overviews out of what we're talking about today. We arranged the book using the fairly well-known among student affairs folks, IEO, Inputs, Environments, Outcomes Model from Alexander's kind of classic conception, Alexander Austin's classic conception of that idea that we have inputs, into colleges, uh, there's the college environment, and then the out outcomes or outputs are related to both the inputs and what happens in that environment. Um, we pivoted in this new edition to talk and think really explicitly about student success for the 21st century. Um, since the original edition of the book, this has become a more sharpened focus, I think, in higher education and the language and vocabulary around student success. Um, and then in the book itself, we include a bunch of instructor resources. So if you happen to be somebody who's teaching out of it or a student who wants to, to read more in depth about it, there are some resources in every chapter that helps you do that. And um, including sort of stable URLs, you can go online and kind of get more resources about a particular topic that you're interested in. So that was our overall approach. And now we'll kind of walk through some of our ideas. Bob, do you want to get us started? Yes, thanks, Chris. I want to start as Chris said, with the with the IEO model in mind, we want to start with the what are the inputs? So thinking about students and, and what uh, some folks are calling the new generation students. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about overall enrollment, um, which this this table shows has been increasing over time. So this table shows two year and four year total enrollment as an as, at the undergraduate level, obviously, uh, in 2000, 2010 and 2018. And you can see that there's been some pretty considerable growth over those uh, two decades or so. We'll point out uh, what, what is hidden in this, in this particular uh, table is that we peaked in about 2012 when it comes to overall enrollment. And so, although it still looks like we've been growing uh, steadily uh, over the last two decades, we're actually in a slight decline right now and, and in, probably anticipate further decline uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and this data do support that does support that the the general growth has been in the four year public sector of, of higher education. So the majority of our growth in higher ed is coming from that four year public sector. Um, a recurring theme today, and this slide is busy. I'll chat you through it uh, really briefly in an overview. But a recur recurring theme today will be that it is important to look beyond these uh, top line numbers. So yes, we are growing, but we need to disaggregate and see where that growth is and disaggregate in very mean in meaningful ways. So yes, we've been growing over the last two decades, but not evenly across different groups of students. And in this um, table, you'll see particularly in that last column, the percentage change uh, between 2000, from 2000 to 2018, 
you'll notice that there's been substantial increase in the percentage of African American and Black students, Asian Pacific Islander students, and Latinx students. And the language here is, is from the census, so um, I'm going to use Latinx here. Considerable growth, particularly in the Latinx uh, category, almost 150% growth. You see, though, substantial decline uh, in the percentage of or the proportion of Native and Indigenous populations, which weren't large to begin with in, in uh, 2020, and we still see a, a decrease. And we do see a small decrease, a modest decrease uh, in the number of uh, and proportion of white identifying students. Students of, of two or more races uh, weren't, um, that data weren't, those data weren't collected in 2000. Uh, so we see just the single number in 2018. And they make up about 4% of people who identify as two or more races make up about 4% of our undergraduate population today. So a couple of other points uh, of interest, I think. Um, there is a non-trivial proportion of students who are part-time, who were part-time students in 2018. But again, looking beyond that top line number, we see those part-time students are not distributed evenly between the two and the four-year sectors with uh, part-time undergraduate students at two-year institutions being overrepresented um, and only about a quarter of the under, of undergraduate students at four-year institutions are, uh, are part-time. 17% um, of students, of undergraduate students, stop out at some point um, in their undergraduate career. And that's, that's a number that um, has been stable and, and is probably as good an estimate as we can get given uh, the way we track undergraduate student enrollment. Um, so it's about 17%. Um, again, those, uh, the, the students who drop out are overrepresented amongst uh, Black and, and Latinx identifying students, single parents, military veterans, and students at two-year institutions. Um, and finally, in 2016, so pre-pandemic, in the before times, uh, we estimated that uh, and found that 43% of undergraduates had taken at least one online course in 2016. That was up from 32% uh, in 2012. And of course, because of the way we pivoted in March of 2020, that number is probably closer to 90 or 95% right now. And maybe this statistic is, uh, isn't necessarily meaningful any longer. A um, couple of other things, and I want you, uh, I offer these as things to think about uh, as we kind of continue our conversation. We've, I mentioned that enrollment was kind of on a steady uh, increase, or at least on an increase from 20, uh, 2000 to, to 2020, uh, and a kind of steady decline uh, since about 2012, uh, maybe a little bit of stabilization right now. Everybody who, who does, uh, who looks at these kinds of issues is predicting an enrollment cliff in about 2025. And so our undergraduate enrollment, num enrollment, num enrollment numbers are predicted to just drop off precipitously about that time. Um, some recent uh, research is suggesting that there's less swirling, and swirling is something we um, when we first wrote the book was new language to me. Uh, we left this section in there um, as we looked at enrollment patterns in the text uh, because it is still going on and it's, it's not trivial. Um, but some real recent research, uh, actually since our book was published, is suggesting that kind of post pandemic and during the pandemic, there was less of this uh, kind of swirling of enrollment uh, patterns where we look at dual enrollments or, or multiple serial kind of enrollments at different institutions and the various ways that that are enrollment patterns that fall under that idea of swirling. <clears throat> and then finally, of course, um, the effects of the pandemic. And I'm going to add the effects of the emerging labor movements, which you know, today we in the news, there, there are three major strikes going on, labor uh, stoppages going on right now. So we don't know the effects of the pandemic. Uh, and honestly, the effects of these, these uh, emerging labor movements um, are going to have on enrollment moving forward. So things to think about, things that um, will affect our, our understanding of, of enrollment over the next several years. I'm gonna keep going then um, and move past, uh, past the enrollment patterns and talk briefly about uh, transition to college. Um, you know, we consider moving students into post-secondary education, you know, research continues to show that the positive effects of first year experience uh, uh, programming and first year seminars in particular for most students. They, they really are good interventions. Here on this slide, I wanted to highlight um, some emerging research about these multi-year comprehensive transition programs um, 
and kind of listed underneath that the, the bullet there, the main bullet there, are some of the characteristics that make these programs particularly efficacious, um, and particularly for students who have been traditionally underrepresented and underserved in higher education. Um, pointing to some research um, by my colleagues, Ron Hallett, um, Rosie Perez, who I just saw on our on our list of people. Hi, Rosie. Uh, Joey Kitchen and Adriana Kizar, um, and some other research with Laura Perna. Um, looking at the at the way these comprehensive multi-year transition programs have been effective uh, in, in improving students foundation uh, as they transition to college and the next slide again points to again i'm going to bring this up um, the the effects of the pandemic that um, on on transition to college i've been doing a little bit of research recently uh, with students at, at here at Iowa State and several focus groups, and we've had some great conversations in it. Um, they talked about kind of all of the different transitions that are going on right now. And so we have the relatively traditional first year transition of coming you know, from high school to, to a post-secondary institution. But for most of most folks, that was from a virtual high school experience right now at that Iowa State in particular to a, an in-person experience. So a different bit of, of transition ex, uh, experience going on. We have second year students who are transitioning to from a virtual first year to on-campus experiences for the first time. So in essence, experiencing a, a traditional first year transition right now in their second year and not really sure we're giving them the correct kind of programming uh, to support those transitions. And then the one that I just had this wonderful conversation with a, with a couple of our, of our third year students who talked about their transition um, going from you know, the traditional first year transition to an on-campus experience being bounced, it was the language they used, uh, to the virtual experience for their second year, and now trying to relearn everything and retransition to our on-campus experience um, for their third year as juniors and, and thinking about all the things that go along with those transfers and, and saying you know, they're relearning things. So transitions are another thing that have been affected greatly by the pandemic and things that we need to think about moving forward. For sure, Bob. And before I turn on to sort of uh, take a little bit of a switch in the presentation, we've had a question about, um, can we define swirling? So maybe we can grab that question before we uh, continue forward. Yeah, thanks. And Ava, thank you for asking that. Um, swirling is a term, it's, it's an umbrella term, and I, I am most closely associating it with um, some work by Alex McCormick and some work by Sarah Robb, Oldrick Robb. Um, and it's an umbrella term meant to define some what used to be considered non-traditional enrollment patterns. Um, and so the traditional enrollment pattern of, of going to a college, being full-time or part-time, graduating from that college later um, is the traditional uh, model. Swirling seems to, swirling encompasses other models like uh, being enrolled at two colleges at once. So dual enrollment. Um, in a, or, or concurrent enrollment actually is the language we would use there. Um, a serial bouncing, but a serial transferring. So starting at a four-year institution, taking some classes at a two-year institution later, coming back to the four-year, the same or a different four-year. There are multiple ways of looking at, um, or, or kind of not multiple enrollment patterns that fall under this idea of swirling, but it's a catch-all uh, um, term to kind of capture some of those, what we would consider non-traditional enrollment patterns. Thanks, Bob. And I would say those of us, uh, I've seen many friends on the call who do things like read uh, applications to master's programs in higher ed and student affairs. And we see this when we see, you know, three or four transcripts for an applicant, right? Because they have to grab the different places they, they did that. So we're beginning to see, I think, more professionals in higher education who have had that uh, non-linear or not sort of straight through at one institution experience themselves. So I think it's, um, definitely sort of present. It'll be interesting to see post-pandemic kind of whether it settles back to the pre-pandemic or there's more or less of this kind of activity dipping mm -hmm. in and out of different schools. So I want to talk, so there was a lot of the I, sort of the inputs and sort of how you get here, right? And then I'm going to talk a bit about what is the here, kind of what is the environment. And um, the we talk and think about contemporary institutional types. And there have been some shifts um, in contemporary institutional types and sort of what is more dominant. Um, I would say the regional comprehensives have become the public access universities that land grants once were or would think of themselves as. Many um, state land grant universities and certainly the flagship public universities um, are selective or even more highly selective in their admissions. So the regional comprehensives have become much more access oriented. 
Um, the for-profits also uh, identify themselves as access institutions, uh, some of them in possibly predatory ways, others in less predatory ways, uh, but they are providing access to students who um, can't access convenient programs in the areas they want at other kinds of institutions. The pandemic economic and enrollment pressures have forced, we've all seen this, some mergers and closures, especially in small nonprofit private sector. Um, I think that uh, two years ago, uh, sort of before the pandemic, um, we were thinking in small ways about sort of mergers and closures. There definitely have been some struggling institutions that were really focused on that uh, enrollment cliff, very concerned about it. Um, the pandemic closures, uh, then there was, you know, the, the sky was falling. I you know, remember reading in Inside Higher Ed, like, you know, predictions of hundreds uh, of institutions closing uh, during and because of the pandemic, uh, permanent closing. Um, and then what we've seen is um, that pressure has continued, um, maybe accelerated the pre-pandemic pressure economically, but it hasn't been quite as uh, much of a complete shutdown of an entire set of institutions that we've seen. We haven't lost entirely our modestly selective private uh, nonprofit institutions, um, typically small institutions, often rural. Um, so those are still there, but there is more pressure on them. And this, um, because they tend to enroll these sort of directly out of high school, more traditional kind of enrollment pattern. And that's where we expect to see the, the cliff sort of happening. Um, those institutions are being very strategic right now about thinking about how to plot their way forward out of the pandemic, um, thinking about creative uh, ways of partnering with other institutions, or um, we are seeing a continued um, ripple of mergers, acquisitions, not words. I think in my early career, I would have thought about for higher ed, um, but when Northeastern is buying Mills College, uh, I, I begin to think more in acquisitions kind of mindset. Um, some of the public systems in Northern states in particular are consolidating or constraining curricular offerings. And the demographics of the United States, of course, uh, the, the recent census shows this really clearly, you know, those of us who live in the northern chunks, um, we are in a decreasing population situation compared to uh, southeast, uh, the Sunshine Belt, I would call it, and, and west coast. So there are systems like Vermont is talking about consolidating the, some of the state colleges. Um, University of Wisconsin system has done some curricular realignment to reduce what they would consider uh, redundancies, perhaps, across some of the um, uh, non-Madison campuses. Um, so there definitely are some public systems in the northern part thinking about how to uh, consolidate, be more efficient, um, differently serve the population of their state. And I think we'll continue to see that uh, interesting work coming out of those uh, institutions and systems. And then clearly the post-pandemic shift to more hybrid, more online engagement degree programs um, at formerly place-based institutions. We don't yet know the full extent of this, um, you know, five years from now, what will the percentage of students enrolled in a fully online degree program at a place like Michigan State look like? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, some of you may be involved in discussions about that exactly. I think for folks who work in student affairs and student services, um, you know, if 10% or 25% of your entire undergraduate student body ends up in fully online degree programs, what does that mean for how we provide programs and services? Um, that used to be a little bit of a, a kind of a hypothetical theoretical game we would, we would play in class and do some case studies, but I think now we need to think more seriously about how do we do that service. And the generation of student affairs professionals we are about to graduate, uh, the folks who have engaged in this kind of online learning, not necessarily voluntarily, I think any of you who are on the call or those who work with, with that population, wow, what a resource, right? The folks who got pivoted on um, or had to involuntarily engage in a year of online learning, I think have a lot of lessons for the rest of us and how we can do good community building, identity building, student affairs work um, through that. So I'm excited about that. Um, and I don't really know or have a good guess of sort of where we'll end up percentage wise. So that's some of the, the general landscape. Of course, we've got um, minority serving institutions are increasing in number, um, the HBCUs from the 1964 designation. We have predominantly black institutions that are not HBCUs and that's not a category everybody has always thought about, but we are getting more and more institutions that are predominantly black or large percentage of the student population. Um, Hispanic serving institutions, of course, that's a category that can grow and is growing. Um, Asian American, Native American Pacific Islander on a PCs, um, the tribal colleges, and then similar to predominantly black institutions, we have Native American serving non-tribal institutions. So thinking about those, which I, we haven't always considered, and then um, Alaska Native serving institutions or Native Hawaiian serving institutions. Um, so those are additional uh, 
minority serving institution designations uh, by the federal government, providing some access to resources, um, and thinking about how a regional comprehensive becomes an HSI, right? So it's not that the categories of MSI sit separate from the categories in the left column, uh, comprehensives and whatnot, but how do we think about with a diversifying student population, um, and we think about the mission purposes, curricula, uh, context of some of our uh, institutional types as they become more minority serving. Um, I'm a graduate of Women's College. I always want to talk about them. Um, there were you know, around 200 or so in, in the like 1970s. We're now down to ee, fewer than three dozen um, almost every day. The news has something. They are increasing, they decreasing in number, but more and more of them are embracing something they will call a gender diversity. So not only serving cisgender women, but thinking about how to serve trans students. Um, so there is some gender diversity in uh, historically women's colleges. And then the US still maintains three men's colleges um, who are engaging with gender diversity in different kinds of ways. So those are a few sort of ideas around contemporary institutional types that I keep my eyes on. And I'm particularly interested in the work on regional comprehensives and some folks in the field who are doing exciting research in that area. So Bob talked about increasing diversity of students. I've just talked a bit about contemporary institutional types. And when I think about, um, I think through eco ecological systems, I saw our friend Carney Strange is, uh, is with us today. Hi, Carney. Um, and Carney is one of the people who got me thinking in ecologies in the first place. So thank you for that good work and important foundational work in the field. Um, and so uh, what you see in the small left circle is that way back in the day, we had a sort of homogeneous kind of student body going to homogeneous kinds of institutions. The large oval in the middle is meant to represent a much more diverse set of students coming to a much more diverse set of institutions, whether they are online and in person or individual learning. Um, so that is sort of that. And then the different kinds of outcomes. Are we getting degrees, certificates, student debt, um, or leaving the institution entirely? So different kinds of outcomes. And the factors that are interacting in those, um, we get person environment interactions for sure. You know, Who am I coming to this kind of institution? Do I find a niche in the environment? Does it feel safe and secure? Um, so the campus climate, which is, uh, more interesting and complex when we have more students, more kinds of students. Um, thinking a lot about belonging and mattering. There's a lot of research now on um, student sense of belonging. And finally, there's been some research that uh, empirically connects sense of belonging to student outcomes. For a long time, uh, we, we thought it was a good idea and thought it was good, but now there's some actual evidence. Gavin Henning has a new book um, out or coming out that actually presents a lot of the research on sense of belonging. Um, but Gavin is a, a co-editor or co-author on that book. Um, and then we do see that there are differential outcomes, right? So not every institution is currently well suited or a, a positive ecology or a supportive ecology for every kind of student. And so that I think is the, the, the work we're doing now is to figure out how do we change our institutions? So for example, Michigan State University recently released a strategic plan. And although the words, you should check out the strategic plan have probably never come out of my mouth before, um, I will say that something pretty interesting to me in that is that our board of trustees approved one of the pillars in our plan is that um, student success is the measure of an institution's ability to create an environment that allows every student it admits to learn, thrive, and graduate equitably, right? So instead of student success being about how this pile of students from diverse backgrounds make it through our institution, student success is the measure of the institution's ability to promote that, to promote student outcomes, right? So that is a real shift. Um, I'm hoping it gets taken up in other places, um, but thinking about how we need to, as educators, change our campus ecologies to create uh, more success for students, rather than just sort of trying to get all our students to fit into us as widgets on, our, on their way through. So that I think is um, one way of thinking about campus ecologies. Um, Ah, thank you. Um, our friends at Stylus have put in, so the Aaron, Aaron Benjamin, Gavin Henning's uh, new book on uh, sense of belonging. Um, I've had a, a sneak preview and I will tell you that it, it, it's, it's exciting. It's good stuff. Sign up for it. Um, so thinking about sort of campus ecologies as an environment, what's happening there? Student learning and development. Um, Bob and I many years ago wrote a paper for an ASH conference called Why Quibble Over Student Learning and, Over Learning and Development? where we sort of took on the historical in the field of higher ed and student affairs um, debates. And there may be people on this call who have uh, feet firmly planted at one side or the other of, are they the same thing? Are they different? Um, there has been a pitched battle between those two camps for a long time. Um, 
Bob and I come down uh, firmly in the middle, I think is fair to say. Um, we don't quibble as much. We say there are absolutely distinctive elements between student learning and student development, and there are absolutely uh, a Venn diagram where things cross over. And parts of the places they cross over and that we talk some about in the book is the processes through which learning happens and development happens, right? So they're distinct concepts, but related. So learning and development both rely on readiness, our old friend, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. You have to be ready for it. You have to be encountering challenges right at sort of your point of readiness. Um, you have to be encountering increasingly complex challenges and demands. We don't increase our learning or development if we, you know, if, if you keep doing quadratic equations and you just do them more and more and more of them and never get to the next advanced step, you won't develop the ability to get beyond that, right? Um, we need adequate support to meet our demands. Um, that goes back to many of us in a master's program learning about challenge and support, which is uh, pretty common sense, but pretty pretty key here. We need the challenges, but we need the supports to get there. And then, you know, Aston's involvement idea. This again, pretty straightforward concept. We need to be engaged in educationally or developmentally meaningful tasks in order to have those happen. So each of them relies on similar processes. And then uh, some of you will be familiar with um, the Brian from Brenner Ecology model, which sort of sets us in some context where that kind of development is happening. The person in the center is interacting in a set of nested environments of the micro, the everyday close environments or digital environments, the mesosystem of the campus peer culture, for example, exosystem of policies that are set that the student sort of isn't participating in, but that affect them. And then the larger macro system, like a pandemic, which has a, you know, affected all of us in different kinds of ways. So thinking about student learning and development, um, that last slide with the increasingly complex set of students coming in, increasingly complex environment of higher ed institutions, and these are the things that are happening there. That's how we, I think, are framing our ideas around. Um, we talk some in the book, um, uh, student affairs in a higher ed literature has moved a little bit away from learning science and learning theories in the past decade or so. We used to be a little more engaged in it. We do re-engage in those conversations and thinking about what do we need to know about, for example, Cold's experiential learning cycle that can help us create environments for learning success. Um, the processes of exploration and commitment that are very key in many social identity development models, but how do students explore um, different ideas, different identities, different ideologies, and then make a commitment to one, and then maybe get challenged and explore it further. Um, thinking about the role of uh, socio-emotional factors. So um, some of you on the call who do more work in K-12 settings will know that SEL, social emotional learning, or SEF, social emotional factors, have become a large research area in K-12. Um, and in higher ed, we have sort of come at it using the terms non-cognitive factors. Um, it's important to know those two conversations connect through things like growth mindset, self-regulation, our friends in educational psychology, helping us think about student motivation and learning. Um, we haven't as much, I think, particularly in student affairs, taken up as much the educational psychology literature around like, really what causes people to learn, motivation, self-appraisal, goal setting. Um, in those explicit kinds of ways that I think are important for us in thinking about the wider context of the environments we're creating. We think and talk some more about what's the context of digital screens. Um, again, I think we all thought the sky was falling or I thought the sky was falling 20 years ago. Ah, the screens are gonna you know, reduce people's ability to learn and memorize and think. And I think that um, we have learned that's not true. Um, I, before the pandemic, I think we were learning that. Certainly the pandemic accelerated a lot of the research on that. Um, but thinking about what is the learning and development context of digital screens, not just social media, but um, screen reading, is that a different cognitive process? Um, interacting with peers online, uh, is that a different social process? So thinking about how we take that into our thinking about the environment of higher ed. Um, and then we think some about the contributions of neuroscience uh, to the work of student learning and student development. And again, I think we haven't talked as much about those ideas, um, but some people working in neuroscience areas would um, push back, for example, on um, myths around um, the best educational environment is one that meets each student's quote preferred learning style. Um, it actually turns out not to necessarily be the most educationally um, utilitarian way to approach that. So trying to think about how we can bring into the field of higher ed studies more work from educational psychology explicitly about learning and motivation, about neuroscience, We've got a pretty decent handle on non-cognitive or socio-emotional, but I think we could still expand that out some more. So that's um, a bit about kind of what we are thinking about what's going on in the environment. Um, can we, oh, yeah, uh, can we before we click. Pause, pause on this slide. 
Um, Anton Tolman, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, from Utah Valley University asked um, and highlighted um, that since it seems likely that online education will continue into the future, should we reset expectations for incoming students uh, that, oh, just one way, just resetting that they aren't going to be 100% online um, and, and that there may be flex, there may be hybrid, there may be high flex kinds of in, uh, learning environments for our students. I was thinking both about this slide and then the one that you just left in terms of, um, you know, as we think first about the transition, which may have been when he, when he was, when, when Anton was asking that, that question, thinking about setting the expectation, which is part of motivation. It's also part of person environment fit, right? Uh, which is part of, and social integration, all of which relate to, to kind of starting at the university and, and kind of progressing at, at a college or university. Um, but Chris, what, in the context of screens, in the context of non-cognitive and social, socio-emotional factors, what does it mean to set students up to understand that they're going to have different experiences that more than or different than the traditional in-class learning? I think this gets back in part to that institutional types and diversity. I think different types of institutions will end up with more kinds of privilege. Um, there will be some subset of institutions that will have the resources to continue to define a very place-based, um, I would use the word boutique learning environment uh, for a very finite set of students. Um, and they will be able to select students who they believe will thrive in that setting. I think other institutions will take a more expansive view of their role in educating a more diverse population. Um, and whether that's geographically diverse or the one's ability to partake in place-based education. Um, I think that many of us will find ourselves embracing an access and success mission that is much more diverse than simply place-based um, or only online, right? So I feel like uh, we have certainly, uh, we have uh, the faculty and instructors in higher education on March 10th, 2020, if you had said, everybody's gonna teach online next year, you can imagine on March 10th of 2020, the response would have been like, yeah, we'll make some committees, get back to us in about 10, 20 years. Yeah, we'll see if this online thing is sticking around, right? We would have dug in our heels, resisted because people have been doing that for years. And at my institution on March 13th, we had literally 90 minutes notice. We got a text from the president at 10.30 a.m. at noon today, every class is remote. Now I can't say those first days of class were particularly great remote classes, um, but I will say that you know, the work that happened that semester over the summer, and then MSU was fully remote last year as well. Faculty worked hard. People spent hours and hours of unpaid volunteer time learning how to get better at this. And I think a, a lot of faculty want to hold on to some of that um, because they did get good at it from a learning perspective and they begin to see some of the benefits. So I think we're going to see presses from students uh, and families who are interested in a certain kind of flexibility. We may get some presses now from instructors who figured out, actually I can, I'm pretty good at this. I, I kind of like some aspects of this. And then I think we'll have absolute institutional pressures um, for economic reasons, for uh, student success reasons to think more creatively about optimal blends. So I think that in that context, it's gonna take a few years to sort it out, being upfront with students about helping them figure out, well, how, how, how do you learn best? In, flexibility, cognitively, those kinds of ways. And then how do we match that to what our institution can offer you? Um, so I feel like there's gonna be a lot of back and forth on that. And we'll have some, um, for very good positive reasons, entrepreneurial institutions that may come up with some interesting new models. Um, and we'll probably have some that stick, you know, fully place-based and some that move fully. I do think that Anton, your point around um, helping expectations with students, I think is really key there, right? Like, so students need to know what they're, they can expect um, so they can make some decisions around the environment they're chosen. Um, uh, Adele, I'll, I'll take your question now. If that good um, right. so, um, so the more foundation, so in fact, in the new edition of the book, we actually took out, um, hopefully this doesn't like turn to any questions. We took out the sections on just straight up student development theory. We don't have chickering in there anymore. Um, so we have really moved away from that because there's other better resources for it than sort of a sh few short chapters in this book. So we've gotten into what we think of as key processes. So that was thinking about um, the slide you see now on the, the learning and development processes, but that idea of readiness, uh, challenge and support, engagement, 
um, and the environmental context. Thinking about those as the underlying key pieces of learning and development and getting away from here's so-and-so, you know, Perry's cognitive development or sort of a specific set of uh, identity development theories. So I think that, um, you know, the question, are we engaging with newer emerging models and theories from scholars of color, queer scholars? Um, uh, we've got away from a lot of the quote foundational theories anyway in the book and looking more at the processes. And some of these processes, the authors are people who, well, I'm a queer scholar, so I would say yes. Um, there's some of my work in there, um, but thinking about um, deferring, and in the book we actually name a couple options, like go look at the, you know, Stuart Abes and Jones book on critical approaches to student development theory, like go out there, because there's so much student development theory out in the world now that um, trying to contain it in a chapter was not a useful exercise for us or for the reader, we thought. Um, so hopefully people find that appealing that we have said, go read all that stuff directly instead of our digested versions of it. Um, so that's my best advice is go read the Jones, Abes and Stewart critical approaches. Um, that's my best advice on that. And it is, we're pretty clear, we're gonna get out of the way on that one. So hopefully Adele, that, that addresses your question. Um, we couldn't imagine how to continue to expand it out in ways that would be good and honor the work and really present the contemporary work. Um, so we took a different direction entirely. Excellent. All right. Um, I think we're switching now to one of the outcomes. So the, you know, as we move through the, the Aston IEO model, looking at one of the outputs or we I would say outcomes. Um, and again, going and thinking about retention and persistence in higher ed, um, just put it out that we've done pretty, uh, pretty good job of improving persistent rate, persistence rates overall. We, you know, best estimate right now uh, using uh, student national student clearinghouse data is that about sixty percent, our six year graduation rate, a retention rate, I should say, and very, uh, there's a difference. Uh, our six year national retention rate is about sixty percent. In keeping with that that idea of digging deeper and disaggregating the data in meaningful ways, um, you can see from the table that our institutions are doing a better job at serving some groups than they are others. Um, if we look at 60% as, kind of, as the national average, um, we see that in general, uh, white students and Asian, Asian American students are performing or, or are, are persisting at that rate. Um, our African American students and our Latinx students um, are at or a little bit below the, the national averages. The other thing to look at that, that um, table as we're thinking about persistence and retention rates um, is that male identifying students generally performing less well or genuinely being, genuinely, genuinely being served less well uh, around retention issues uh, than female identifying students in the same racial and ethnic groups. So there's a lot of information in this one table um, that if, you're, if retention and persistence is what you're interested in, um, there's a lot to be, to be studied there. We are doing a better job at retaining all students. We're just not retaining them equitably across racial and ethnic groups in particular. Um, this slide, I just wanted to put out there, the, the, the chapter on retention and persistence, much like um, what was the chapter on, on student development theory, retention and persistence is its own course. Um, and um, there is another book coming out uh, from Silas, I hope in, in 2022 that John Braxton and I are, uh, are working on with, a, with colleagues, an edited volume that explores um, retention and persistence rates and, and, and theories and research and practice um, uh, for, very, for different uh, groups of students and, and different kinds of institutions. But really what it comes down to is these are the, the large uh, broad areas that can influence uh, student success around re retention and persistence. So we can look at student demographic characteristics knowing that those are related to um, other experiences that relate to persistence. Academic preparation is one of them. Um, so the quality of, of or the, the experience, the quality of the experience you get from your high school directly relates to, to the persistence and retention in, in higher education. Commitment and aspirations, these are those non-cognitive variables that get built upon starting early in, in childhood and continue to be built upon uh, until and, and through 
uh, college university experiences, the organizational context and cultures, this is what, what Chris was showing in terms of um, what kind of institution, not in its, its own, say, organizational demographic characteristics, but is it bureaucratic? Is it, is it, um, is it collegial? Um, what kind of feel, anthrop anthropomorphic kind of feel does that have for different groups of students? How does that sense of place affect the, um, their ability to, uh, our ability to retain and, and their ability to persist? Student cultures and subcultures, who are you hanging out with and are they, are they encouraging um, success and persistence uh, is part of it. And how do we continue to build upon that powerful group, that powerful influence of peers um, and, and when it comes to learning and retention and persistence. And finally, the individual student experiences, good and bad, affect the student's decision to persist. Um, and that's a place where higher education institutions um, can look and try to encourage positive experiences for students um, so that they feel like they fit and they feel like they belong um, as a way of, of improving retention and persistence. So, so I there's always sort of the question be like, is, is college still worth it? I mean, that's a big question in the press right now, right? And the public. And so this in short, um, the, the retention and persistence and outcomes literature does say, yes, college matters, going to college matters. And then what about college matters is sort of what we're thinking about. So there is evidence that we, we summarize in the book um, and we can refer to our colleagues, Matt Mayhew um, and uh, et al uh, on the, uh, the impact of college on students um, sort of summary, but for sure, college matters, students develop cognitive skills and they have intellectual growth, more so if they were then were not in college. There's psychosocial change, identity-based, but also values, attitudes, um, people's moral and intercultural and civic ideas, ideas about diversity, equity, and inclusion. These can all change as a result of going to college. And there is a career and economic impact of going to college. Um, all four of these differ by demographic categories for sure. Um, there are systemic racism and sexism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, classism that have intersecting effects with college to mean that you know 10 years after, um, not everybody ends up at the same point. Um, but college itself does have a net gain in every, all these areas. But why? So what is it at college that matters? And these are really the, the sort of the unsurprising things we've known for a while. Um, social science is sometimes delightful in its lack of surprises, right? So the nature of student faculty interaction, um, how often students and faculty are interacting, the nature of that interaction, is it uh, simply course-based? Is it moving to others or students' lives? Um, pedagogies that involve collaborative and cooperative experiential learning um, have a higher impact on cognitive development and psychosocial change, attitudes and values, then non-collaborative, non-interactive pedagogies, and then the enduring value of uh, an influence of peers, whether it's extracurricular in one's living environment, in one's classes, um, the quality and nature of those relationships, the depth of those relationships. Now, these are all um, areas that have been studied, uh, not often a comparison one for one for a person who didn't go to college, for a person who did go to college, you know, what is the peer influences on, um, a 19 year old who's been in the military for a year versus a 19 year old who's, who's been in college for a year. Um, what are the peer influences on somebody who's been in the workplace for that year instead of in the military or in college? Um, military is a workplace, I understand that. Um, but so there's been less of that kind of uh, investigation, but the within college examinations of faculty and students, pedagogies and peers does demonstrate some differential impact around engagement, engagement with different others, um, being taken seriously, the opportunity for mentoring relationships have a higher impact um, than the absence of those. So that is, um, I do think our field could do more and better in terms of comparisons with non-college goers. Um, but for now, what we've been able to see within college goers is differences that can be attributed to some of these different factors. Um, Terrence Brown, um, I wonder if this is my friend, Terrence Brown from across campus. Um, high school, uh, Bob, I'm thinking this feels like maybe a Bob question. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. High school preparation. So Terrence asked, uh, how might high school preparation be measured uh, in the literature? Um, Terrence, uh, generally, yes. Uh, I think it should, it should finish your question. Is it focused exclusively on curriculum or, or did it uh, also control for variables such as well-resourced schools? Um, generally, you know, the easy way to, to think about and the easy way to kind of control for quantitatively 
uh, high school preparation, honestly, is, is looking at things like uh, uh, high school GPA of the individual student, average uh, ACT score of the high school itself, um, which we know, or I should say average in, uh, admissions test score of the high school itself. These are all uh, ways that quantitatively we've looked at uh, high school preparation and, and it doesn't feel good to do it that way. It, when we think about curriculum, I go way back to when Cliff Edelman was writing his toolbox. He's two, two wonderful documents, um, blanking on the, the full name, I just call them the toolbox documents, um, where he did look at uh, individual level student variables related to the courses students took and in, in the curric so the high school curriculum as a measure of um, of quality of, of high school preparation. And yeah, he found that, you know, having taken more math courses and up through algebra in high school it was a pretty strong indicator of, of eventual success uh, in, in high school, in college. Um, and again, that still doesn't feel real great because it doesn't count for kind of the differences in resources that we know are true in, in, a, in, in the United States in particular, when most high schools are, are funded through you know, income, or, or I'm sorry, through property taxes. Um, and so there's not equity across uh, resource, across high schools when it comes to, to funding and resources. Um, so I don't know that I have a good answer. I think Mike um, Bastido has, um, so Mike Bastido has been doing some cool research on college admissions, college preparation, holistic admissions, but also the contexts mm -hmm. um, and thinking about uh, what it means to understand some of those background characteristics of the location of the education. So I feel like that, um, looking at it's B-A-S-T-E-D-O, um, uh, some of Mike's work, it's not book length, but I think there's a couple of articles out now. He may be presenting at Ash in a few weeks, um, for sure. We have a question from Carney Strange in the chat, and then I see one from Stacy in the Q&A. Um, Carney's question, uh, who is tracking incoming students who've been homeschooled, and what impact does having a job on or off campus, concurrent with studies, affect retention and degree completion? So I have seen some research related to homeschooled students and kind of broad indicators of student success in college uh, and enrollment, honestly, through the Department of Ed. And I think some of their reports, they're doing some some good jobs um, tracking homeschoolers. I haven't seen it in our in our refereed or archival re, uh, empirically based research articles. It, am I missing somebody, Chris, that you know of? I recall. Uh some studies about the experiences of homeschooled students, but not more in terms of the like the, the tracking success, those kinds of things, or even where exactly what kinds of institutions they end up at. And, and the idea of a job on or off campus, um, I think that re related to uh, retention and degree completion. My understanding of, of that overall literature is that it hasn't changed a lot um, over the last several decades, meaning, um, Having a job on campus, a work study job in particular, um, not only allows you to have some money, but also is, is one way to feel, for lack of a better term, integrated into the campus life. Um, in particular, it's, and it's particularly beneficial if that job is within your field or with a faculty member and you're, you're able to build a connection there, which is speaking to um, a little bit of Stacy's question. Um, and, and then the more you work off campus, uh, the more time you spend off campus as a full-time student working for pay, uh, especially if it's disconnected from your, your field of study, uh, the more that experience uh, negatively affects uh, uh, probability of persistence to graduation. So there is a balance for everybody. It's not clear. We used to think that you know 10 hours a week was the optimum level of, of work, but I don't know where that research came from. I mean, I don't think that's the case. Because it also depends on on how much money you need to pay your bills, and that's a, a, a reality for many of our students. Um, Stacy has asked the the role of faculty student interaction. Is there a window into the role of professional staff, student affairs professionals, and others interactions with students? Oh, you. So. I wanted to bring this up, Stacy. Thank you for, for raising this. I, I was thinking earlier. I think it was Anton's question about um, the hybrid and high flex because we were thinking primarily about the the course delivery method. Um, one of the things we're finding here is that students are appreciating the ability to, for 
for virtual engagement with academic advisors. And we do know that academic advisors uh, as a student affairs role, whether they fit within academic affairs or student affairs at your institution, they're still performing a, a, a student affairs role. Um, the role of, of academic, the, the importance of academic advisors when it comes to student success and persistence to graduation um, or goal attainment is, is huge. I mean, they are, they are the lever when it comes to improving retention for most folks. And so making sure that they're available, giving the academic advisors the flexibility to meet mm -hmm. virtually um, when they can, when they're available and when they want to uh, has really been helpful. I look for that to be an area of study and, and, a, and an area of improvement um, as we move forward, kind of, and the use of, of technology to do virtual meetings for students and quick meetings for students is, is going to be a powerful tool, I think. And I think that sort of general, like there is definitely a little cottage industry of studies in higher ed about just student faculty interactions, and there's depth, a huge one around peer interactions. I actually am not as aware of studies of just straight up the influence of staff student affairs, higher ed helpers, others on students. There are some smaller people, like I, I feel like it comes in in some other places like campus jobs, right? The interactions of students who work on campus, their interactions with staff, whether those are professional staff or um, culinary staff or custodial staff, um, there is evidence in that set of literature about student work, about the connections they make, the ways those things matter, being seen and acknowledged by adults. Um, I know students are adults, I mean, uh, supervisors, for example, those kinds of adults, um, those have a positive effect on students. There's evidence of that, uh, but just in general, like, does it matter um, how often you interact with your student government advisor? But Chris, the other place where I, I see that, and I guess this may be my interpretation of a bigger research finding, is when we look at students who live on campus, right, and we, we, we can say students who live in residence halls can have uh, statistically significant higher GPAs. They have, they're statistically significantly more likely to persist to graduation. So some of those measures of success um, are statistically significantly predicted um, by, by living on campus. And I think most of us interpret that, uh, interpret that as uh, knowledge of and access to student support services. So those would be the interact. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an indirect understanding of the importance of interacting with student support services and student affairs professionals um, through, you know, access you get by living in a residence hall. So that maybe is where that uh, I would point to that as well as as an as an indicator that we matter. I, um, as you're saying that, Bob, uh, and for lack of other questions, I'll just riff on that for a second. So please throw your questions in the Q and A, or Bob and I will keep riffing. Um, I wonder if um, some of our, I, I've got a project going on right now around how student affairs and student success professionals use data on campus mm -hmm. and all the gray data we have around dining and housing, like card swipes and all that kind of stuff. I do believe that through some of our um, digital systems, we can track some of these. So definitely advisors, there's, there's many campuses that use an pl advising platform that would let you track how often somebody's Met with their advisor, um, but there may be other um, platforms that are letting us see how often a student is interacting with the financial aid staff or somebody else that we could begin to um, co uh, maybe tip up, to create a typology. Like, is it is it transactional? Like, I'm meeting with the financial aid staff because I need to do a thing with my thing or the registrar's office or even I need to register my student group. Um, is that different? Could we think about that as a different than like what many of us in the field might think of as like. Uh, a very purposeful advising-y kind of leadership development opportunity. So I think there's a wide free dissertation topics, handing them out right here mm -hmm. on the webinar. Um, I think there could be some really interesting work in uh, qualified, like describing the different kinds of interactions we would be talking about and then how would we measure them? Um, I think that could be kind of cool. So I'm reading Carney's next question, which is an interesting one and probably don't have time to get into it deeply, but um, you know, it, he's recently heard, Carney's recently heard that males are becoming an affirmative category at some institution. Is that an emerging trend? I don't know. Um, I do know that in, at, you know, specific institutions within specific majors, um, you know, there is an affirmative uh, attempt to attract more win. men, sorry, male identifying students. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm in the School of Education and we're constantly um, doing our best to recruit 
uh, male identifying students to our elementary ed program um, and our nursing program in the College of Human Sciences here. So I would say another way of looking at this, very simple, look at any institution that when you look at their uh, sex statistics is exactly 50-50 or mm -hmm. super within one point, one way or the other, um, and then ask what their applicant pool was because the applicant pool to most highly selective institutions is skewed female. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a female applicant pool, you know, you're skewed 55% female applicants, but year after year, your student body is 50-50, leaving out all the binary heteronormativity of that Noah's Ark approach to selecting a student class. Um, that suggests to me that in fact, there is purposeful uh, over admission within the male side of the applicant pool, um, assuming that the male and female applicants are relative. And if you look at a school as large as many of the highly, highly selective IVs and the many, many thousands of applications they get that are skewed female, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking there may be some selection there. Totally anecdotal, and yet I think really true. Chris, I think we're about to get cut off because it's, it's, we've got two minutes left, and we would be remiss. I think Chris and I would both feel bad if we didn't mention that Brandon Smith is, is watching this today, and, and Brandon uh, was a graduate, is a graduate student at Michigan State and was instrumental in the publication of this book, um, and, and want to call him out and say thank, and thank him publicly. Big thank you, Bob. Giant shout out to Brandon, who um, in fact was instrumental in the content and the ideas and moving the book forward. So really very grateful. And Bob, do you want to bring it home? Stylus. What's yeah. that? Do you want to bring it on home here at the end? No, I think our, our friends oh. from Stylus are going to jump in. I will jump in. Thank you, Bob. All right, thank you to our authors for sharing their time and presenting with us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in with us live this afternoon on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering college students in the United States, second edition, use code CSCE20 to get 20% off the book and free shipping from Stylus Publishing. I will also share the link to the book page in the chat bar as well as the discount code. The webinar video replay will be available next week and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds. And all of our event registr registrants today will receive direct links to the discount code um, and to the webinar replay in a follow-up thank you email, which you'll probably expect uh, early next week. If you have any feedback for this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. Thanks again and have a great afternoon. I will stay a little bit longer in case anyone wants to save anything in their chats. Um, we can also share the chat bar um, uh, dialogue on the book page as well. Thank you, everybody. Bye, all.